See, the fear of failure is not new. Jesus wants us to learn that when we refuse to take risk, we refuse to live by faith. And listen, Jesus wants you to live by faith. He wants you to have a faithful life and to live by faith. That is his plan for you. And that is what I hope you get out of this message if you get nothing else, that God's got a plan for your life. And that plan is for you to live for him. Everyone fails. James 3, 2 says we, are, we all stumble in many ways. A study's been done, and they discovered that the failure rate of human beings is 100%. Nobody's perfect. Romans 3, 23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Great men in the Bible, you can turn to Hebrews and you can see time and time and time again, men of God who failed God. Abraham failed to believe that God would give him a son, so he slept with someone that wasn't his wife. Jacob was a thief. Then God allowed him to bless the world through his children. See, God is forgiving. Even when these men of God failed him, God is forgiving Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Look what Noah accomplished. He survived the flood, but he ended up getting drunk. Moses made excuses and he shuddered, but he said, I can't do it, God. There's no way I can lead my people. But God greatly used him, and the nation went forward. David committed adultery with Bathsheba, yet David became known as a man after God's own heart. And you can go on and on and on and on, friends. And you can see these men of God that God chose us. And aren't you glad that God chose you? You're not worthy, are you? You're not worthy to be where you are right now. You're not worthy to be a Christian. But because of a wonderful uh, word called grace, God's unmerited favor that you're in a relationship with Jesus Christ right now, it's not something you earn it's not something you could ever earn. It's given to you because God loves you so much that he sent his son to die upon that old rugged cross right there so that you'd have forgiveness and reconciliation and sanctification. We don't deserve it, but God gave it to us. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 25 and thank you God for light so I can see to read. Matthew chapter 25 we're going to look at a parable here. Some call it the parable of talents. I'm reading out of the New International Version. Some call it the parable of the bags of gold. But here it is. And follow along as I read. And this is what the message is going to be on in the next 20 minutes. Again, it'll be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. The one he gave five bags of gold to another two bags and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Did you catch that? They were given certain things according to their ability. And I believe this, God gives you certain things according to your ability. God knows exactly how you're going to handle it when he gives it to you before he ever gives it to you. It's according to your own ability that God many times gives you certain things. And that's exactly what the scripture says. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received the five bags of gold went to work, went at once and put his money to work and gathered five more bags. So also the man who had two bags of gold gained two more. But the man that had received just one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received the bags of gold brought, it to the, other, brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with the bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. 
you have been faithful with a few things. I will, I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you had not sown and gathering where you had not scattered seed. So I was afraid. Did you catch that phrase? He was afraid, fear of failure. For I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put your money on deposit with the bankers so that when I return, I would have it re received at least back interest. So take the bags of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For whoever will be given more and they have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from him. Are you listening? And throw this worthless servant outside into the darkness where they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Well, it's part of the human experience. The fact is this, we all fail. If there was some kind of club that we could join and only failures could join, I'd be right there in that club for every one of us would be eligible for membership. Remember the poet that said, if you have never failed, it's an easy guess that you've never had any great success. The reason we fail is very simple. We fail because we risk nothing. We try no new things like changing jobs or falling in love or relocating to another state. You create something, but you're afraid. And you never succeed because of your fear. See, we risk failure when we try anything new. And the only way to avoid failure is to never dream, never set goals, never have vision, never try anything new, never reach out. See, remaining fixed, are you listening? Remaining fixed, afraid to dream, remaining status quo is a horrible way to live. Now listen to this. You'll never become what God wants you to be if you're afraid to risk failure. Everyone needs spiritual dreams. Everyone needs vocational dreams. Everyone needs rec recreational dreams and dreams for your family and your home and your church. And we must have these dreams with a commitment to achievement. The fact is this, all achievement takes great commitment and there is no substitute for work. You follow that? In a church, if you wanna build this church and you wanna see this church grow, it's gonna take a lot of work. You can put the very best pulpit man in this church and whoever you hire to be your next pastor, he can be dynamic in the pulpit, but if the church don't work together and get out there and tell people about Jesus Christ, this church will not grow. First church I was ever in was one of the fastest growing churches in the restoration movement. It was called Surly Creek Christian Church. We averaged 100 additions and baptisms a year. But I'm gonna tell you something, my staff worked. We went out there and we beat the doors. We advertised, we had billboards, we did everything you can imagine. We had radio broadcasts, we did everything possible to get the word out. And I tell you what, that's what it takes. It takes sacrifice and yes, it takes money to do it. But there'd be nothing that would please me more than for Helen and I to come into this church someday and have to look for a seat. How about you? Nothing would please me any more than to have to come in here and look for a seat. See, when we are afraid to try, it paralyzes our potential. 
I wonder how many dreams have died, how many failed to try, how many settled for less than what God has in store for you because you were afraid to try. If you think you'll lose your loss, for success begins with the fellow's will. Often it's all in the state of mind. My friends, God wants us to think like winners. Do you ever think a team goes into the Super Bowl expecting to lose? I don't think so. No, they go into it with a state of mind they're going to win. You think any couples ever stood on this altar right here and said those wedding vows and looked at one another in the eyes and held those hands and says, honey, for better, for worse, I'll never leave you. You think any of those couples ever thought they'd go through divorce court in a few months or a few years? I don't think so or they wouldn't be standing there. You know that half of the marriages today statistically ends in divorce. That's pretty sad, isn't it? One half, that means that one half of everybody stands on that altar and holds hands and looks one another in the eye and says those vows before God and their friends and their family. One half of all those, if statistics stands, will end up in divorce court. And I don't think any of those couples, when they're standing there, even think of the word divorce. Churches that grow in proportion, churches grow in proportion to their visions. I love that scripture. It says, where there's no vision, people perish. If you don't have that memorized, memorize it. It's a great scripture. Where there is no vision, people perish. It's a good rule to remember. Churches who strive to be dynamic churches often become dynamic churches. Let me ask you this. Do you believe that First Christian Church is a dynamic church? My goodness, you think I was in the Catholic Church. I didn't want to amen. Now, I'm going to say it. I'm going to ask you one more time, and I expect somebody to get a little excited. That's all right. We're not Pentecostal here. Don't think we're going to, you're going to be moved out of your pew if you say amen. But how many of you think this is a dynamic church? Amen. That's better. I think this is a dynamic church. I wouldn't be in it. I promise you that. I'd find another church to go to that's dynamic. I think this church only has a great future. Amen. I think it's unreal what God's getting ready to do in this church in the next few years. I was never here in this church when it was packed out, but you've had it packed before, haven't you? I was never in the church when it was packed out, but let's pack it again. Amen. Let's do it again. Let's all work together and do it again. It's possible. And I think that's what God's will is for the church. He wants us to make disciples. Fear of failure is not new. It's been around a long time. But let me just mention some things about the scripture that I read. Uh, Jesus is talking here about three servants. He's getting ready to take a long journey. And he's talking about three servants. And he entrusted to them his possessions before he took off for the trip. He divided his money up among the three and he said, I want you to invest this money. And the first one did exactly what he asked him to do. He invested his money, took a risk, but he, and he doubled his money and the Lord complimented him. The second man did the same. He invested his money, he doubled his money, and God complimented him. But the third man was afraid. And I wonder how many in this congregation would be like the third man or the first man. If God is giving you something this morning, and he will, God's always giving to us. Sometimes we don't recognize the blessings. But if you're alive today and you're sitting there breathing and God's giving you today, he's giving you something. Amen. Take advantage of it. Take advantage of it. Invest your life in God's work. Invest your life in God's timing. Because as high as the heavens are above the earth, so is his ways higher than our ways. Invest your life with God. But the third man, though, he had a bad acute case of fear of failure. So he hid his money. He dug a hole. He put it in the ground with this attitude, nothing ventured, nothing gained. And the Lord was greatly disappointed to him. The reaction of Jesus to these three men is very interesting. 
In verses 25 through 26, it says, I was afraid, so I went out and hid my money in the ground. And Jesus replied, you wicked and lazy servant. Now, those are tough words, aren't they? We don't have to look at those words very long to understand what our Lord meant by them. Those are harsh words. But here's the fact that Jesus is speaking about. When we play it safe, we refuse any risk, and we fail to live by faith, we do not please God. Did you catch that? I have five, do you guys usually get out at 11.30? Let me say that, yeah. Well, I have five minutes to preach a five-point sermon. That means every point has got to be a minute. One minute. I'm going to preach a five-point sermon. You'll say, I never heard a preacher to preach five points in one minute. Most preachers don't even write five points. Most of these sermons are three points, but this one just happens to be five points. So here it is. I'm going to go through them real quick with you because I want you to get it. Number one, remember everybody fails. It's universal. I've never met one who had not encountered failure in his life at one time or another. But listen, there's only one that's never failed. And his name is Jesus. That's the only one. Everybody else is in the failure category, see. We all make mistakes. I remember when I was in high school, I was a football player, and I won a best defensive uh, player of the, of the year. I didn't think I was going to get a trophy, and I was so excited. I ran down to get the trophy, and I stumbled and fell. And you talk about embarrassment, that was pretty embarrassing. Now, the, the, the coach didn't say one thing about my coordination. He said a lot about the fact that he was a hard worker, he was a good tackler, and all these other things, but I think he was as embarrassed as I was embarrassed. But everybody fails. I remember when Miss America dropped her crown. I remember when Burt Parks read the wrong list at, at a Miss America pageant. I remember when President Reagan stumbled down the steps of Air Force One. I've seen soloists trip over wires and on stage. I remember doing a funeral one time, and I almost fell in the grave. There's been times when uh, I'd forget my sermon. I know you can't believe that. There has been times when I would totally forget what I was going to say. And I just finally stopped in the middle of it and said, I've lost my place, don't know where I am, so let's just go up. And they never knew the difference. But we all make mistakes. That's point number one. It's pitiful, but we all make mistakes. Point number two. We must realize that failure is seldom fatal or final. Let me say the fear of failure is, the worst, is not the worst thing we'll ever go through. Proverbs 24, 16 says, For even though a righteous man falls seven times, I love this verse, if he falls seven times, he'll rise again. I love it. He falls seven times, but he rises again. I once preached a sermon entitled Knocked Down, but Knocked Knocked Out, and I was thinking about my dad. My dad was a boxer when he got out of the service. And he used to tell me about he'd get knocked down. Well, most boxers do get knocked down. But he said the greatest fights that he ever won was when he got knocked down and almost knocked out and he got back up and won the fight. That's the best fight you'll ever go through. And I don't know how many of you are knocked down right now, but I guarantee you if you're knocked, down, if you're not knocked out or knocked down now, there'll be some time in your life you're going to be knocked down and you're going to need to look real hard at Jesus Christ, amen? See, fail, failure is seldom final. George Washington, he lost two-thirds of the battles, but he won the Revolutionary War. Napoleon graduated 42nd in his class, and he's only 43. And yet he conquered Europe. Babe Ruth hit 714 home runs, but he struck out 313. He struck out 1,330 times. Mickey Mantle took his team to the World Series seven times, but he struck out five. He struck out two thirds of the time. He only hit 500 uh, home runs. Galatians 1:9 says we must never be tired of doing good because if we don't give up, the struggle will reap a harvest at the proper time, and that is so important. Remember Lincoln? At nine years old, his mother died. At 22, he lost his job as a clerk. At 23, he went in debt with a partner, and he, 
he, his business failed. At 28, he proposed marriage, and she turned, his, turned him down. At 37, he was elected to Congress after he had been defeated twice before. At 41, his four-year-old son died. At 45, he lost as he ran for the Senate. At 47, he ran for vice president, and he lost. At 49, he ran for Senate again, and he lost. At 51, he was elected president of the United States. Why? Because he never gave up. Thirdly, recognize the benefits of failure. There's a lot of benefits to failure. Romans 8, 28 says, all things work together for the good for those who love the Lord. And I pray and hope, as our preacher just preached recently on that very scripture that you love the Lord. See, all things work together. Good things, great things work together for the good. Failures educate us. They teach us a lot about God. They teach us a lot about our, ourselves. Thomas Edison had 10,000 failures before he came up with the right filament for the light bulb. And this is what he said. He said it was an education. He says, I now know 10,000 ways that it don't work. 10,000 ways it don't work. 10,000 ways that it don't work. Folks, I know a lot of ways I've tried things that just don't work. Just don't work. Well, fourthly, here it is. Failure helps us discover our true talents. Remember the story of Nathaniel Hawthorne? Well, there is a great writer. If you've ever read his work, Nathaniel Hawthorne was a great writer. He was fired as a clerk in Salem, Massachusetts. He came home and said to his wife, I'm a failure. I, I, I've been fired. She didn't say a thing. She simply handed him a pen and she said, start to write. You've always wanted to write. Now he says, write. And I think most of you that's an English expert or know anything about English knows that he became one of the greatest writers of all times in American history. But if he had not failed, he would never have written. If he had not failed, would never have his writings. And that's sad. There was a guy that failed in real estate. As you well know, that's my career. I develop real estate, sell real estate. I've had failures in it, and I've had accomplishments in it, and I know all about both ends of it. But there was a fellow who failed in real estate, and you know what he did? He decided he was gonna flip hamburgers, and he opened up McDonald's. Would you say he did pretty well? There was another fellow that I like a lot. I like to eat. I know good food. If you want to come with me today, I'll show you some good restaurants. I know them all in this town. I know where good food is. But there was another fella that uh, was getting up in age. He lived on Social Security in Kentucky. He started cooking chicken at the age of 70. And what was his name? Colonel Sanders. You think he's done pretty good? Going to KFC today. They're all over the world. And lastly, failure makes us less judgmental. People who fail seem to be more sympathetic with others who fail. And I've had a lot of people just hug my neck and say, Dan, I'm sorry you failed. Those are the kind of people I want. My broker, many of you might know Adrian Green. He's that kind of guy. If I fail, I guarantee his arms are going to be around me the next day and saying, that's okay, we'll get another deal. He's that kind of encourager. I wouldn't want to work around no other partner than that. Somebody's going to encourage me. See, we live in a society that programs perfection. It's good to have a few failures early in life so that we can realize that in this flesh, we're not perfect. And we're not perfect, believe me. I love that bumper sticker that says, Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven. I heard about a basketball team that had lost 40, that had won, pardon me, 42 consecutive wins. They finally lost. And they interviewed the coach. Coach says, what do you have to say? He says, it's great. They said, what do you mean, coach, it's great? Because now we can focus on winning instead of losing. Now, that's my sermon. You today, let's stand together. You today can focus on winning instead of losing.